And welcome to uh, another class in the bunker. Uh, thank you for joining us today and thank you for being uh, part of this. Uh, what a joy this is uh, every week to, to be able to prepare and to, to get this ready in such a way. And I've been so grateful for uh, people that have reached out in so many other states and things to, to let me know that, that they're here. And um, it, for, for those of you who don't know, for, for, for years and years we've always done this as a Monday morning class. Uh, from 9.30 to 11 in the chapel and we always had a wonderful group of about 85 to 100 uh, and just had a great class. Uh, one of the, if the, sil the, one of the silver linings I think to this COVIDness is the fact that we've been able to through this medium to be able to reach out to a group uh, about five times as large. Uh, and thank you for that. that how, how enjoyable is that? And I'm glad that uh, we can provide this. Um, now, next weekend is both Easter and General Conference. So just as a point of note, we, will, we won't be doing this class next week so that you can just enjoy General Conference and just enjoy Easter and uh, we'll be back at this in uh, two weeks. Um, so let's go ahead and get started today uh, if we can. Okay, now we're going to talk today about uh, bondage and the feeling of being trapped. And there's a lot of ways that we end up being trapped by a lot of different things that can produce that trappedness, uh, if you will. And, and the feeling of being in bondage and not having very many options. Uh, one of the things that I have observed over the years uh, is if, if you've ever if you ever been on a cruise and certainly as we have led people on cruises uh, sometimes I've observed this and and that is that uh, when when you when a cruise ship stops in a port and people have a chance to do a day outings and be all over that particular place whether whether it's Rome or Rotan they're just going to enjoy what's there and then the, the cruise ship people will always say you need to be back by 3.30 or 4 and let's say that it's 3.30 and we need everybody back by 3.30. Invariably as you're back and you're watching you see the the uh, peer runners, people running at the last minute, running because they're late and then there are times that it's we said 3.30 and at 4.30 an hour late someone shows up and the ship has already pushed off and is on his way and they're left standing at the pier saying we made it back but you're an hour late uh, and, and sometimes that those are good good excuses they got caught in traffic something happened uh, and there's a reason why they're late and sometimes they just weren't paying attention didn't weren't wearing a watch or something and they get left behind I was thinking about this uh, earlier as uh, last time we were talking about Judgment Day and how Judgment Day we're in forever fear wrongly I believe of waiting for that gavel, God's gavel to fall and pronounce our destination for eternity from which we have no escape and it's celestial kingdom and there you are you know and maybe you'll get visited by good people um, and so we worried I think unhealthily about the idea that 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 would be that moment where we would, it would be determined as if that moment when now the ship has left and we're left on the dock and everybody that we love is heading off on the good ship celestial kingdom and we're back here over on the dock uh, left to our own devices and trapped. Well, there is th that, that misunderstanding of how it is that this process works goes to our greatest fear, which I think is being trapped uh, in a place where we feel like we don't have uh, very many options. Um, not too long ago I was working with a, a client of mine who struggled with depression, struggled with anxiety, and, and one of the ways that she had learned to cope with that depression, anxiety, was just to isolate in her room. And that brought her temporary relief, 
from having to face people or having to not feel good in public and just not have any responsibilities about her. She just isolated and hid in her room. Over time, as that room was kind of a salvation from the stressors she might run into, that room slowly, slowly, slowly began to be a prison for her. Her anxiety and her fears trapped her in that room to where she got to a point where she didn't feel like she had options to go outside that room. That the house was as far as she wanted to venture, the idea of outside was too terrifying and, and too fearful. And, and what had started off as a salvation to her, a respite from the storm, was turning out to be a prison with bars that she felt like she couldn't escape. It's one of the reasons why sometimes depression has been called a lack of options because the more we become depressed, the less options we feel like we have. We just don't. I can't do this because. I can't do that because. I would do this, but I'm, you know, and, and you start to have these rules and walls and conditions and boundaries on what we can do and say and where we can go. And that limiting feeling, that feeling of being trapped, leaves us feeling very, very much in bondage. And trying to push out of that sense of being trapped is a very fearful experience because somehow we're going against the, the rules of our head that have created what we can do and what we can't do and have limited in life what our choices uh, really are. So I, talk, I want to talk for a little bit about uh, bondage and kind of a sense of where that, that really started uh, to begin. Because of all places and where you wouldn't necessarily expect, believe it or not, the first place that we may have experienced some feeling of bondage or being trapped or being limited in our options might actually have been in our pre-mortal life. Um, I, I think we tend to think of it as this, the, the wonderful place that it was in living with our heavenly parents. Um, but one of the things that, that we, I think we started to be able to learn in, in our pre-mortality experience was that as we looked around to be godlike is the ability to grow and progress. Gods grow and progress. They move ahead. They're not stagnant. They are constantly moving forward. Now, in contrast to that, to be damned is to be stopped in any progress. That's what a dam does. It stops water. It dams something up. Uh, there is a large uh, ship at the moment that we are talking about this, a very large ship uh, trapped in the Suez Canal sideways and it is damming traffic coming from each side. Uh, in a sense, the traffic uh, that normally flows through the Suez Canal is damned. It is blocked. It can't move forward. And I think what we started to see in the pre-mortal life, as wonderful as this was, we were also damned in that we couldn't progress in certain ways. And so what the, the wonderfulness that was the gift of agency granted us the ability to begin a walk of endless learning and growing. Agency said you're going to be able to make choices and you're going to be able to spend eternity growing and learning and developing. Except there was a problem with that. And with more knowledge, actually came more of a knowledge of, of some disappointment and some understanding. Because, uh, to quote uh, the prophet Lehi, actually talking about Adam and Eve, but I think it also applies very much uh, to the pre-existence. Adam and Eve knew no joy. And, and stop for a second. They knew no joy. And you say, well, 
it's the Garden of Eden and things are beautiful and they don't have to work and they just eat the fruit and things are wonderful and you know they don't have kids messing up their living room <laughs> you know and and Lehi says no they knew no joy they might have been happy in their sphere but they didn't know joy why for they knew no misery doing no good they weren't even able to do good why because they knew no sin and what he's trying to tell us is that uh, in a very uh, trivial sense the fact that you might enjoy in the next few days a beautiful spring day and you feel the warmth and you feel the sunshine and you see, see the leaves starting to bud and the flowers are coming out you enjoy that why because winter was here and we were walking out of winter by contrast we enjoy what we enjoy because of those times when we are without that. And what he's trying, and what we were learning in the pre mortal life was you can't really know joy because you haven't yet known mortality and misery and pain that comes with that. In a sense, in the pre mortal life, we were trapped. We were in bondage to not being able to progress because we didn't yet have a physical body capable of knowing misery to go with the happiness that would come with a, with a, a mortal body. I don't know if we necessarily always think of ourselves being in bondage in pre-mortal life, but we had, but we, the, uh, the prospects of continuing to grow in our progression were so great that to the extent that we could, we shouted for joy. Job says because we knew what was coming or thought we did now so for this reason a physical flawed painful constantly unfair mortality as we know would be part of developing joy but but try and explain that to us in the pre-mortal life you're going to know pain. You're going to know physical pain. You know nothing about a root canal. <laughs> I hear that's bad. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it will be really bad, but you're going to have to, to experience it. You're going to have to go there. Okay. So, off we, so down we came to experience bondage and unfairness and pain and misery so that we could know joy. So what is, what is this bondage and blessings of mortality? Well, as we know, mortality provides great opportunities for growth and joy. That's why it's here in our own parenthood experiences. We get a chance, a small taste of what uh, our heavenly parents have experienced uh, with us. We get a chance to enjoy the diversity of a, of a planet filled with all kinds of things. Uh, I don't think that I got to enjoy barbecue while I was, while I was in the pre-mortal life, but I get it now. Uh, there were no sacrificial uh, pigs that were willing to give up their ribs in the pre-mortal life to, to come do this. Okay. Now, however, as we know, physical mortality then brings with it what I call ennobling entropy. Ennobling entropy. From the moment that we are born, we begin the process of dying. From the moment that we enter mortality, our physical bodies kind of build to a certain amount of maturity and then they start to decline. Uh, I continue to be wondering who the old guy with white hair is staring back at me in the mirror because he wasn't staring at me when I was a missionary at 19. I saw a different guy altogether. Where this guy came from, I don't know. But I know that as we age, we're watching entropy, the slow decline and the slow dissimilating of our mortality continues and no matter how much we may want to fight aging ultimately aging 
captures us all. So we experience our slow decline and mortality is about, brings with it genetics. Even the genetics of our flawed genetics of alcoholism or depression or anxiety or muscular dystrophy or chromosomal defects, um, uh, the, many that struggle with uh, same-sex attraction were born with genetic struggles that would lead them to battles they didn't anticipate that they would have. The problem with aging is, is certainly there. Uh, and, and we struggle with how we handle that. Toxicity. We come in contact with things in our environment uh, that in the pre-mortal life we never would have thought about black mold or about uh, a genetic or environmental uh, virus that we would have to be fighting globally in a pandemic sort of way that was not there in without a physical body. So, so mortality was going to bring with it things that decay and things that fall apart and things that are much less than perfect. So mortality ends up being a very flawed, painful experience over and over and over. And, and, and we certainly uh, know this and, and understand this. We don't always like it, but we know that that's true. Now, on top of the physical side of all of this kind of thing, here's the other part, and that's, and that's the natural man society. This, this earthiness, as Paul would call it, the earthly man, is so prone to pride and war and unfairness due to our natural proclivities on a variety of things and in so many ways all of this kind of stuff really kind of runs the, all, the idea of all of this and our struggles whenever we're, we're causing some kind of pain for somebody else it really is an attempt to increase my range of options by limiting yours if I can have more of something, you're going to probably have less of us. It's kind of that idea of scarcity. If I'm going to make more money, then you're, I, I, get, I only get to enjoy the fact that I'm making more money because I, by comparison, I get to see people that are making less. So I feel good about myself. And there is that proclivity towards pride that says, I feel good about my spirituality because I know you're not quite as spiritual as I am. So therefore I can kind of build myself up. And, and by the way, bless your heart, you join the church and we're grateful to have you in a ward. Do you know that my lineage goes back eight generations in the church? Yes, I'm, I have deep roots in the church, and, but I'm glad to help somebody who is a novice to the church by someone who is so deeply rooted in pioneer stock as am I, because I have more than you and you have less. Uh, and our, our pride is driven on that. So I, I feel sorry about your bondage of not knowing as much as I do. I have more options because I know more. You know, we just build ourselves up on this thing even in sake of spirituality and and those kind of things okay that is mortality that creates pain and suffering for other people now as one author uh, uh, actually a BYU professor of mine uh, Alan Bergen used to say <sighs> We all have agency. We were all born with agency. It's just that some people are more free than others. Based on our circumstance or sometimes even our ethnicity, there may be a sense of saying, I feel like I have more options, I have more possibilities than you might have. And we get, and, and, and that that sense of that, that a kid growing up, for instance, in a wealthy family is automatically going to see more options on the table 
than a kid growing up in a very poor setting deep in poverty just isn't going to see the, um, the same amount of options in front of him or her. So yes, we have agency, but, that, but the, the reality is, is that our, our agency is impinged in so many ways and so many possibilities that even our choice about whether somebody accepts the gospel or not is so limited and so trapped by tradition and understanding and the person bringing them the gospel and in so many ways it's so incredibly unfair for us to turn around to almost anybody on the planet and say you had a, every opportunity to accept the gospel and to live it when we have no idea all the things that that got in the way and trapped them into a sense that they really didn't have that freedom to make that choice isn't that wonderful then that the eternities for us are about a chance where, where Jesus then can work with us in a setting of love and kindness and all of the toxicity and all of the genetic abnormalities and all of the addictions and all of the traditions and all the things that get in the way that make mortality so inherently painful and unfair are removed. And in the midst of all of this then, now for the first time somebody has a chance to have a much broader, fuller range of choices attached to the agency that they have and to make a fully informed decision. That's why at the end of the day, as another author has said, maybe not everybody is saved, but certainly no one will be denied. Because they'll be able to exercise that agency in search of joy. Now, so, in one way or the other, in one way or the other, all of us have a sense somewhere of being trapped by emotional illnesses, physical illnesses, by our circumstances, even by our own traditions. It traps us and limits us. And mortality is about learning about those limitations. Now, l let me add one more piece that then to the, the choices that we might make. So here, here's my warning. In mortality, the things that appear to save us can also enslave us. Let me say that again. In mortality, those things that appear to save us may also end up enslaving us. Wow. Think, for instance, in a, an extreme case of someone using heroin and they are being enslaved by the pain and fear of going cold turkey and all the physical pain that that would cause. They are saved by getting their next fix. And for a period of time they, there's relief. I'm not gonna face that pain of withdrawal and everything that goes with a very painful heroin withdrawal. And it's very painful to watch. I've, I've certainly been there and done that and watching and helping people go through that process. But they get a reprieve. They get a saving and things are good for a little while. But what's actually happening is, is that addictive substance, be it drink or drugs or pornography or, or spending or gambling or whatever it is that brings a temporary salvation. In mortality, these things tend to be very, very enslaving because they are temporary in nature and because they're not of a godly substance that sustains joy and growth in the long run. It's a temporary 
salvation that is illusory in nature and and yet we rely on it uh, to a certain extent even mortality brings with us the, our necessity of eating and eating can be a temporary salvation for something that we're going to need four hours from now okay so we're kind of enslaved to eating if you will that's a there's a real metaphor there a symbolism if we really wanted to go there okay so so where does salvation come from where does true salvation and eternal salvation come from in the long run well let, let's return again to the Old Testament to what we've been looking at and you get this this interesting wonderful cycle about how God will save those in bondage now in the Old Testament we we're getting this story in from uh, Genesis where we're going to talk about the fact that the 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 older brothers of of Jacob of Israel felt enslaved by their younger brother Joseph in the same way that Cain felt enslaved by his younger brother Abel okay he's driving me nuts he seems to be getting more things how can I put up with this I'm you know where is he's driving us nuts and their way of solution was to sell Joseph into Egypt and I have to think as Joseph is disappearing on his on the camel and he's being hauled off to Egypt they had to be repeating Cain's phrase now I am free of that obnoxious little brother Laman and Lemuel probably often felt that as well about Nephi can't we just be free of this guy let's beat him with a rod now, as it turns out, the, ens the enslaved brother actually ends up being the one that saves the brothers during that time of drought. And they were enslaved by the drought in Canaan. And they're going to come out of Canaan to Egypt where the brother that they enslaved will actually save them from enslavement because he is providing grain and sustenance and a beautiful place to live, Goshen, near the, near the Nile River, great place we have been saved by the one we enslaved. Temporary salvation. Because when we get to where we're going here in the next couple of weeks here, we're going to find that 400 years later, the saved are once again enslaved. The Pharaoh that knew them here, this Pharaoh 400 years later did not know Joseph and enslaved the saved, who had in turn enslaved <laughs> their brother who saved them. <laughs> Amazing, right? Um, so, so one of those unasked questions actually is is this. Remember the drought was only going to last seven years. Seven years of good times, seven years of bad stuff. So a couple of years in, we get all the people of Israel, of Jacob, we get them out of Canaan, we get them settled in Goshen. When the drought was over, why didn't they leave Egypt and go back? Five years later, ten years later, why didn't they go back? We don't know why. <laughs> Here, here's, my, here's my uneducated guess. The thing that, ensave, that saved them ultimately enslaved them. That, that uh, Nile River Valley that they settled in was far nicer than Canaan where they could come from. The food and the harvest was greater living in that river delta than in Canaan where it was pretty harsh. 
they had been saved. Why go back to a, a worse area? And they hung around and didn't leave. And they stayed and grew in, in the very thing that in the front end would save them and ultimately in the long run would enslave them. In the same way that my client years ago saved herself by isolating and that isolation became enslaving rather than finding a way to push forward and to continue to grow because the problem with mortality saves is that they are ultimately damning. Salvation, Earth's way, mortal way, will damn us, meaning that we won't progress. Only God's way progresses. Entropy attacks everybody and everything in mortality. So we have to ultimately find God's way to be saved, not mortality's way. Now, as we look towards kind of starting to wrap up here, I want to start planting the seeds for how salvation works God's way, how we get out of bondage God's way, not mortality's way. And that comes from not looking to mortality's salvating, salvating? <laughs> saving ways, as opposed to trusting in the way that the Lord does it. Because how did the Lord then look at these people that were enslaved for 400 years and were crying out to God now to say, please save us, Hoshana, Hoshana, uh, save us. Uh, which is interesting, we're recording this actually on, on uh, Palm Sunday when the, the people in Jerusalem came out with their palm fronds at, at Passover to replicate something they would normally do at the Feast of Tabernacles six months later with Hoshana, Hoshana, God save us. How would God save them? And as he did on that Palm Sunday, salvation would come in the person of a Savior, not, not through mortal uh, limited saving ways. So that's why when we start looking at Exodus, salvation begins for these people in bondage. A man from the house of Levi went and took a Levite daughter and the woman conceived and bore a son and she knew that he was goodly and she hid him for three months. The rescue from bondage began with the birth of a child. And this ought to, this ought to have some resonance for us when we start talking about Moses as a Christ figure. Salvation and, and release from bondage for the children of Israel came because of a birth of a child. And they wouldn't have known that salvation was in their midst any more than did the people at Bethlehem really understanding that something miraculous had occurred. When she could no longer hide him from the Egyptian overseers who were trying to kill off male children, she took a wicker ark for him and caulked it with resin and pitch. For the Jews reading this stretch, a wicker ark, resin, pitch. The, this is Noah. Here again is another child born to be somebody who would rescue from uh, the dangers of mortality. This is Noah. This wicker ark and the resin and the pitch are exactly what was done in the ark and it had that resonance and so Moses was seen as another Noah. Place the child in it 
and placed it on the reeds by the bank of the Nile. It's a bit of a, of a uh, foreshadowing to the path through the, the sea of reeds that he will bring the children of Israel through. And his sister stationed herself at a distance to see what would be done to him. And Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the Nile. Her maidens walking along the Nile. She saw the ark amidst the reeds and sent her slave girl and took it. Okay. Now, I want to finish today with, with this idea. And we will certainly flow into this in two weeks uh, when we pick that up. But look at what is being created here. And that is a pattern. Look at, look at this pattern for God's way of bringing us out of bondage and out of uh, being trapped. There's a child that's born to a promised people to be saved so that he can continue to grow and not be killed. He must be sent away out of their midst. He's going to be placed on the waters into a basket of vehicle lined with pitch and sent forward. On the receiving end of this, farther down the waters, is to be discovered by a royal woman in Egypt, nurtured by the birth mom. They'll actually go back and get this mom, his mother, to come and nurse him because he's, he's, he's still not yet weaned. He will be raised as an heir to the king. Whoops. And his sin, the killing of the Egyptian to protect some of the other Hebrews, his sin will then exile him into the wilderness. Now, I want to kind of finish today by having you think about here is the pattern, and this ought to be familiar at a couple of levels. First of all, think about the Savior. He's born to a promised people in the premortal life. To be saved, to grow, he must be sent away. He needed to come, to condescend down to come to earth. To be placed on the waters. Now, the waters, real quickly, without making this too complicated, the Jews, the ancient Jews were not a seagoing people. They weren't. And there, there's a reason for that. That is that the waters, when they looked at Genesis, and they looked at the chaos of the waters, that the, remember that in, Gen, in Genesis, in that first creation, the spirit brooded on the face of the waters and out of those waters came land and, and life. But it was mysterious because sometimes there were sea dragons in there and the Leviathan. We don't know what's in the waters. And the Jews tended to stay off the waters. And because the waters were seen as a mysterious creation place. And we don't want to go there. But for, but for this Christ child to be placed in the waters and in a physical body, his physical vehicle, that Jesus, like all of us, would be born in the waters. If you think about birth and the ambionic fluid, uh, we, are, we are placed on the waters as part of this this transition from pre-mortal life into earthly life. So what happens on the other end? Well, this Christ child, like us, like Moses, okay, is discovered by a, a royal woman, not this time not in Egypt, though she will go visit Egypt, but in Bethlehem. But also, once here, nurtured in some ways that we don't understand by the original birth mom. In some way that 
Heavenly Mother is involved, I think, in this. One of these days, maybe in the millennium, we'll get to know exactly how that works. But raised as an heir to the king, uh, the king of uh, the throne of David. But because of his perceived sins in trying to rescue and save people, his sin will exile him, exile him into the wilderness. Not just the wilderness for three days will he, he will be tempted, but the wilderness of death. He will be exiled by the Romans on a cross and be cast out. So, I, I want to kind of, kind of leave it right here. And again, we will pick this up in two weeks. But brothers and sisters, let, 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 let me end this by, by, by bearing a witness that there's no question that mortality with its unfairness and pain and trappings and bondage is a very painful place to be. Nobody wants to be in pain. And so often the way that we choose to relieve that pain can be bonding and trapping in and of itself because it is mortality's way of doing it. But it doesn't bring lasting joy and it doesn't bring the eternal joy that we want. And what we, are, what we oftentimes choose to save us will in, instead enslave us. The Lord's plan involves having us learn by this experience, learning to uh, prize the sweet as we've come to know the bitter. And as we do that, we're going to find, we're going to understand better why it is that we came to this earth life and how important that was. Brothers and sisters, I bear you my testimony that the Lord loves us, that this mortal experience with all of its pain and struggles is a, both a bonding, trapping, painful experience, and at the same time, our, our greatest opportunity for growth and, and a godlike progression into the eternities of joy. I bear you my testimony that that's true. And I leave that with you in Jesus' name. Amen.